Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, this is going to be my talk. I've got uh, maybe about 20 minutes or so. And one, of the, one of the things I like about this type of talk is that I can expand it and contract it as needed. Um, this is sort of like a small introduction to the kind of conference and session this is going to be. Kind of humorous, very uh, uh, personal and, and in touch. Sorry about the, uh, the crappy uh, transitions as we go through. We had to convert to PowerPoint. Uh, a little bit about me. I do work for Red Hat, a great open source company. Uh, I know that they're uh, one of the sponsors. We don't have a booth here this time. They also are very, very um, uh, good as far as letting me do all the stuff that I want to do with open source. Uh, I'm also uh, with the Apache Software Foundation, which I did help uh, co-found uh, a number of you know, years ago. Uh, also, uh, we're on the board of directors of Outer Curve, the Outer Curve Foundation, and I'm also on the board of directors of the OSI. Uh, as you can most probably tell by my outfit, though, I am not a, uh, a, a, a corporate kind of person. I am a developer, a hacker. I've got the traditional garb of a hacker. You can catch this in the wild jeans and a dark shirt. Um, and that's what I really look at myself as, as a developer or a hacker. And that really is one of the great things about, uh, about open source is that it enables you to, uh, to have your passion. Now, my opinion, I think open source as a topic can be kind of complex. Okay, what exactly is open source? You hear all things about licenses and community and governance and things like that. Um, and I thought that we could take some time this morning to try to distill down some of the complexities of open source to some basic components inside of it. Okay? Not to walk away with you know, uh, deep, intense knowledge of what open source is, but maybe enough to be able to figure out, OK, these are the questions that I want to ask, or these are the areas of open source that I'm interested in. Now, unfortunately, during the conversion process, we kind of like lost the, uh, the video right here. But I see a number of uh, people who are you know, kind of old like I am. How many people remember uh, Schoolhouse Rock? Oh, god, great. Well, how many remember uh, the, uh, that one uh, video, three is a magic number? And that's what this thing was actually, OK? Well, really, when you think about it, three really is a magic number. You can actually look at a lot of complexities inside of open source and distill them down or boil them down to three different variations. For example, why? Why do people worry about open source? What is it that draws people towards open source? And there are three different audiences for the open source technology. First of all, there are the hackers and developers. Why do people do this? Why do people use their volunteer time to do this kind of stuff? And I've always considered uh, uh, you know, developers and coders as artists. People have a drive to develop the code. People have a drive to share that code with other people. And open source provides a great opportunity to do that. You get to display your wares to the world out there. You're able to also have your wares uh, be world changing. And you get to learn from other people who are in the same boat. So it's a great uh, draw for open source developers. Now, for companies and organizations out there, you really have the ability to have this great impact in IT, as, as, as we saw and as we'll see in the next two days. Okay? Open source is changing the IT landscape out there in a real contractual way. And it also enables people to be more nimble and create more revenue and more profit for themselves. And for users, you have access to the source code. You're avoiding lock-in. You have stability and reliability that you wouldn't be able to have with commercial closed source proprietary things. So those are the three main reasons why we see people really, really involved inside of open source. Another key factor are what are the um, definitions of open source? And there are actually two. I mean, we're using the word open source, but one could also use, in some areas and some audiences, prefer the term free software. Okay, what are the differences between the two? What are the characteristics of those? Well, I try to think of them as promises. Okay, the open source initiative has 10 uh, conditions which define an open source license. The Free Software Foundation defines four freedoms that a code needs to have inside there. Well, I try to distill these down to actually three specific promises that open source provides. Now, to make this easy, let's use an analogy. Let's pretend that software and code are cookies. Okay, not only the recipes on how to make cookies, but also the actual cookies themselves. 
Now, with that analogy in mind, let's look through and see what the promises are that open source provides. First of all, you can use the cookies. You can either use the recipe to make your own batch of cookies, or you can actually use the actual cookies themselves and eat them and enjoy them and have fun with them and crumble them and dip them in milk and all kinds of good stuff. Okay, what you want to do with the cookie is really up to you. Even if you don't want to eat it, if you just want to throw it like a Frisbee, that's fine. There's no condition on how you use what we provide to you inside of open source. The third aspect, the third promise of open source is you get to modify what it is you have, okay? And right here we're seeing that you're using a basic recipe for one type of cookie, but you're making all different kinds, okay? You're modifying that recipe to do what it is you want it to do, okay? Also, we have the actual cookie itself and you decide to put frosting on it, okay? You're changing what that cookie is. The person who gave that cookie to you didn't want frosting on it and you say, I like frosting. I really like vanilla frosting. I want to even put some sprinkles on this because I really like sprinkles, okay? Again, that's a promise that open source and open source technology provides to you. And finally, the ability to share the, 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 the cookie, okay? You get to share the recipe. You get to share the cookie. This is something that you're providing to people out there. And the nice thing and the nice difference between uh, uh, cookies Oh, okay. Can people still hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. The nice thing about uh, cookies uh, as compared, I mean, the nice thing about code as compared to cookies is that uh, if you give away a cookie, you don't have a cookie anymore. It's not that way with code. Okay, you make a copy of it, you can give it away to people. So sharing is actually much more flexible, much more powerful when you're talking about open source and code than you are with cookies out there. Okay. Licenses, okay, this is the real big bugaboo, you know, in a lot of cases when you're talking about uh, open source out there, okay. What, there's a wide variety of licenses out there, both open source licenses and free software licenses. What are the main defining differences between those? And I think that there's a nice easy way of trying to figure out and boil down three separate types. First of all, there's the give me credit type. This is like the, the Apache license, the BSD license. These are open source licenses that basically say, I'm providing this software, this code to you to do whatever it is you want to do with it. You just can't call it your own. You have to give us credit, okay? That's the only thing we want in return is some recognition for what we've done. But as far as you know, how it impacts your, your software, your code, your business model, it's really up to you. We provide it for you to you. The second part, the second type, and the, uh, uh, the lesser uh, GPL uh, is a good example of this, Mozilla and Eclipse, are the sort of like weak copy left licenses. And these are the give me fixes type. And this basically says, if I provide to you a software code base and you use it in larger work, okay, we don't care what you do with that larger work basically, but if you fix what it is what we've shared with you, we really expect you to share those fixes back to us. So that way the entire community that's using that shared piece of code gets to enjoy the freedom and the flexibility and the additions that you added onto that. But we don't make any conditions or any worries about what you do on the larger side of the work. And this is a really nice uh, way of, of, of ensuring that the actual code that you're sharing is always maintained, that you always get fixes back, that a community is involved and focused on the development and the working of that particular code base. And finally, there is, uh, for lack of a better name, and because it fits in nicely with the whole theme, the sort of like, give me everything, like codes. And this is what I consider a strong copyleft code. Now, I know Bradley Kuhn is here. He almost probably have issues with that. And I really encourage you to go to, to, his, uh, to his talk. But the idea between, behind these kind of uh, 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 software licenses, uh, the GPL, the you know, general public license, is a prime example of this, is that, we are providing to you software which is free, okay? And that freedom is very, very important to us, okay? We want to ensure that if you're using that free software inside of anything else, inside of a larger work, that because you're depending on free software, we expect your overarching reach of software to be free as well, just as free as what we're sharing with you. And that's only fair, okay? If your software is depending on this, then the rest of, you know, we need to ensure 
that the entire product is, is free as well. So looking at licenses in this way, it's important to remember that a license is a tool. Okay, a license is designed by you, the developer, on how you want to share that code. Okay, I run into too many people who say, this is the best license in all times. And it's not, certainly not the case. Okay, think about how you want to uh, share your code. Think what kind of audience you're looking towards and pick the right code, the right software license for the right code and for the audience you're looking out there for. Finally, the idea about community and, and governance. Okay, what are the aspects associated with those? What are the three main types of, of, of governance models associated out there? First of all, there is the, uh, what I call the walled garden variety. And these are our open source projects, which at least in my opinion, are open source in name only because they provide the code under an open source license, but it's impossible for you, the volunteer developer, to get involved because it's controlled by a corporation. It's controlled by uh, some kind of you know, external entity who want final and absolute control on the direction and the focus and the feature set of that software code base. They provided an open source license, but the, the governance, the community itself, is not open. Okay, uh, and we won't go through examples of this. I'm sure you can pick of you know many many uh, you know possibilities and, and uh, you know versions of uh, of this type of a uh, walled garden environment. The second type is is what's called the uh, benevolent dictator for life model, and these are the uh, uh, I love Dennis, um, and these are the type of models in which the uh, supreme power derives from a mandate from the masses. Okay, someone is given by the community the ability to be the final authority. Okay, for example, you know, uh, you see it a lot in, in uh, languages out there like Python and Perl and things like that. You see Guido and Larry, uh, you know, Linux and, uh, and Linux, you know. These are all models in which there is a, a single person who is the ultimate authority. That the community has a lot of power, has a lot of flexibility, can control their own destiny, but if there are issues, if there are problems, if the community is unable to reach a consensus, okay, the, the benevolent dictator for life has the final authority. And the community knows that they can rely on that person, that they have a fallback position by this person out there. The final model is what's called tr true meritocracy. And the Apache Software Foundation actually runs under this model right here, in which there is no leader. There is no core developer. There is no one person more important than everybody else. We're all even peers. They're all even peers out there. The idea is that to make sure that the community itself is healthy, you have to force the community to work together. Okay, so these are pure, 100% peer-based uh, mechanisms out there that allow the community to grow and thrive by ensuring the community always grows. And finally, we'll talk about some aspects about community building itself, okay? And what are three main ways uh, that you, as an open source developer, as someone involved in an open source community, can help ensure the growth and the continued viability of that community, okay? First of all, use email lists. Now, you don't have to necessarily use email lists but the idea behind it is don't disenfranchise any potential developers out there. Okay, why are email lists great? Well, first of all, they're archived. So if I go away from a project for like three, six months or so, I can go back, check on the email list, and find out what happened, you know, assuming all the development is done on the email list. So even if I go away, it's very easy for me to come back. Also, email lists are asynchronous. Okay, if I live several time zones away, I don't feel disenfranchised because everybody else is on IRC at the same time, discussing things, making design decisions and stuff like that. It happens with the ebb and flow. It's much more conducive to a widespread, uh, you know, geographically diverse community out there, okay? And the other thing is that it's sort of like the lowest common denominator, you know, inside of uh, communication matters out there. Sure, wikis are great, IRC are, is great and stuff like that. But the sort of like, you know, asynchronous archive communication process that mailing lists provide is very, very important. It's very, very crucial. Again, don't disenfranchise anyone because you never know when the core team of developers who are currently operating or developing a software code base will go away. 
and you want to make sure that you always have that fresh blood available. Uh, secondly, drive consensus, okay? Make sure that every person's voice is heard, okay? This includes increasing diversity inside of communities, making sure that people are, 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 you know, feel driven and empowered to be able to be parts of those communities. But also it's important to be respectful inside of these mailing lists and discussions, okay? Make sure that a community uh, works through issues and don't let them fester. Okay, this is, can be a very, very hard thing for a community to do is to work through these design issues. That's the reason why, at least in my opinion, the, um, the benevolent dictator for life, you know, scenarios, um, you know, are, are good. You know, they certainly have validity out there, but I think one, but the problem is that they always know there's a fallback position. And I think it's too easy for a lazy community to overuse that sort of fallback position, okay? Luckily, we're not seeing that in, in the communities out there which do that, but it is something to, uh, to consider and worry about. And finally, avoid the idea, the concept of poisonous people, okay? And, and there are a number of, of great um, you know, YouTube videos about this. Poisonous people are those people who may be incredibly productive as far as the development of the code base. May be incredible developers or uh, document uh, uh, writers or things like that, but just drive a wedge within that community, okay? Now, you know, in much more, um, you know, corporate type environments, poisonous people may be a necessary evil. Okay, yeah, this guy is, or this girl is a real pain, but they're productive, we can segregate them away someplace and, and we'll make do. In an open source community, when the community itself is poison, that poison grows, okay? And it affects the entire community out there. So it's really, really important to um, avoid poisonous people, be aware of that, and try to mentor people out there. Now certainly, this has been a very, very quick summary uh, of you know, different methodologies of open source. Uh, I really encourage everyone to go to the sessions today and really look into, uh, into all these aspects. Because really, all of, the as all of these aspects, differences in models and, and, and licenses and stuff like that, there are sessions associated with those. So really look at those. The second thing is that, you know, hopefully, you realize and, and you, uh, you understand that as complex as open source may be, the main ideas behind it are things you learned in kindergarten. Have fun and share. You know, everybody be friends and let's, and let's enjoy ourselves. So with that in mind, I am done. Uh, my slides will be up on SlideShare. Uh, if you're not following me on Twitter and you want to, that's my, my Twitter hang, handle right there. Um, if you have any questions, if there's anything that's not clear or stuff like that, I encourage you to grab me during the next two days and, and let's chat. Uh, or if you want to, send me an email or things like that. Uh, you know, I promise to respond to those as well. Um, that's it for my presentation. I thank you all for sitting here and enjoy the next two days.